so just to share with all of us what we are up to uh, we were doing these lines in Savitri page number 82 uh, the last few lines eternity's contact broke the molds of sense a greater force than the earthly held his limbs huge workings bared his undiscovered sheets strange energies wrought and screened tremendous hands unwound the triple cord of mind and freed the heavenly wideness of a godhead's gaze and on these last three lines unwound the triple cord of mind i had shared that there are reflections of uh, shurobindo on liberation from the sense of body liberation from heart and mind and that's what we have been up to uh, reading and reflecting in from the synthesis of yoga so last time we had started with <coughs> Yeah, so we had started with chapter eight, the release from the heart and mind. Before this is uh, chapter seven, the release from the body that too, we can take it's a short chapter. And today we'll just continue the release from the heart and mind. And we were on page number 351. And we had done this emotional mind, how it uh, entangles itself and how we were talking about that the desire soul confused the, the confused entity we call as our soul that this is me this is my intense you know whatever uh, thirsts that i want to fulfill in my life so the desire soul we mistakenly take for as our true soul that's what we were reading last time and now it's the proper function of thought mind so what about the thought mind? How does that entangle itself and what's the release? So if anyone is feeling ready, we can read aloud from so to the pro proper function of the thought mind. Yeah. <clears throat> anyone who feels inclined to read. I can try. It's very small in my phone. Okay. So, thank you. So, too, the proper function of the thought mind is to observe, understand, judge with a dispassionate delight, in knowledge, and open itself to messages and illuminations playing upon all that it observes and upon all that is yet hidden from it but must progressively be revealed messages and illuminations that secretly secretly flash down to us from the divine oracle concealed in light above our mentality whether they seem to descend through the intuitive mind or arise from the seeing heart. But this it cannot do rightly because it is pinned to the limitations of the life energy of the senses, to the discords of sensation and emotion, and to its own limitations of intellectual preference, inertia, straining, self-will, which are the form taken in it, by the interference of the desire of this desire mind, this psychic prana. It is said in the Upanishads, our whole mind consciousness is shot through with the threads and currents of this prana, this life energy that strives and limits, grasps and misses, desires and suffers, and only by its purification can we know and possess our real and eternal self? Uh, do I follow? Or... OK. 
Okay. <clears throat> it is true that the root Do you want me to follow? Or? Monica can't hear you. Now is it audible? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I was uh, sorry, there's some error with this, you know, spooky, <laughs> my spooky <laughs> wire. So anyway, uh, either we can take a break here or we can also take it in continuation. So Yuan, if you want to go ahead, please read this paragraph as well. Okay. It is true that the root of all this evil is the ego sense and that the seat of the conscious ego self sense sorry, is the mind itself. But in reality, the conscious mind only reflects an ego already created in the subconscious mind in things, the dumb soul in the stone and the plant, which is present in all body and life and only finally de delivered into voicefulness and wakefulness, but not originally created by the conscious mind. And in this upward procession, it is the life energy which has become the obstinate knot of the ego. It is the desire mind which refuses to relax the knot even when the intellect and the heart have discovered the cause of the reals and would be glad enough to remove it. For the prana in them is the animal who revolts and who obscures and deceives the knowledge and coerces their will by his refusal. Yeah, thank you. This is again, you know, as with every word and line of Mother and Sri very, very powerful. And often just the lines that are in front often you would have seen you know many a times we understand theoretically that you should let go we understand that we are too sticky we have to become non-sticky but even then we are finding ourselves asking the question yes yes i understand and get what you are saying <laughs> but how do i let go so this is where the catch is you know so see what he is saying here that this it is the desire mind which refuses to relax so it's like there is a very strong stickiness a strong stubbornness in hindi we call it zid you know that we are so stubborn that if i want this to happen this way it has to happen this way you know for some few things in our life that we are stuck at so it may be people situations you know this is how it should be happening. We may not be very outspoken about it that, uh, yes, yes, I want it in this way. That's why I'm suffering. No, we won't be able to say that. That requires a lot of honesty. You know, usually we are not that honest. But inwardly, we are feeling that, yes, theoretically, I understand. Intellectually, I know I have to let go of things and relax. But how do I do this? So that is the desire mind, which is, interfering you know so the desire mind which refuses to relax the knot even when the intellect and the heart have discovered the cause i know why i am suffering i know i am suffering because i am stuck at this person stuck how this relationship should be stuck how my life should be i have images you know so heart and intellect know they have discovered why I am suffering, why the body is manifesting diseases, all that knowledge we have, the gyan we have. But an intellect and heart have discovered the cause of their ills and would be glad enough to remove it. For the prana in them is the animal who revolts and who obscures and deceives their knowledge and coerces their will by his refusal. And it says the animal, the desire mind says, no, but I am not letting go. Okay, you die. You die of this disease, but I am not letting go. That is how the ego consciousness can eat us up. I am not letting go. I, I understand everything. Intellectually, theoretically, I understand the causes of my misery. 
but I am not letting go. And we don't even realize that this is not our true self. That's the catch. You know, we think that it's my desire and I have to fulfill. We don't desire, we don't, you know, uh, it doesn't get revealed to us that it's not our fulfillment in fulfilling our stubbornness and desires. Our fulfillment is stepping back from the desire soul because desire soul is not our true identity. So I think this, this paragraph is very, for me, it was very like, you know, it came out uh, really to me. Yeah, anything here before we move upwards and take the first para? Anyone? <clears throat> it's like, you know, uh, if my hand is in fire and I know it is fire and it's burning, shall I need to ask anyone, I know it is in fire and I know you are telling me that I should remove it, but how do I remove it? You know, I would not be asking. It's like, it's a natural reflex that I see my hand in fire. I see the hand is paining, it's burning. And if I want to save my life, I have to remove it. So I won't be asking anyone. Yeah, I see my hand is in fire. I know what you are telling me is right, that I have to let go and I have to remove my hand from fire. But how do I do it? When I am asking this question that how do I do it, then I don't know that my hand is in fire. It's not fire in front of me. There is some promise still that that, you know, whatever looking image in front of me in which my hand is holds that something it will give me some fulfillment it will give me because it's like, you know, it's like fooling ourselves. We are fooling ourselves all the time. Really, and it's because of this, and now Shorabindo makes this very, very clear that it's because of this desire mind that we are fooling ourselves. The stubbornness of the desire mind that no, I am not letting go. No. So it's, it's a kind of a very, we see our stupidity here. You know, that the very fact that I am asking that how do I remove my hand from the fire means that I don't see the fire. It is not yet fire for me. It is still some sweet honey like, you know, kind of a emulsion for me in which my hand is lying. And I'm thinking, yeah, one day it will yield me some fulfillment. It's not yet fire for me because it, if it was truly fire for me, then it would not even take a second for me to remove my hand. I would not be keeping asking for, you know, that, oh, I know it is fire, but how do I remove my hand? That would not be happening. So, and here is the root cause, Sri Aurobindo says that it is the desire mind which is refusing. It is hell bent that no, no, it has, the fulfillment has not come so far, but never mind, it will come, it will come from this very source. You know, and we keep dipping our hand in the fire and the whole body gets burned. We get all kinds of diseases. <laughs> you know, we, we are informed by the body that we are taking a way which is not right for us but we don't listen to that information. And then we say to ourselves that, yes, I do understand this, but how do I do it? So I think this is how we really, each one of us, we fool ourselves at our stubborn points, refusing to relax. Very powerful. This one, I think it was very revelatory. So we just take it from the starting. It was I just could not help myself, you know, taking it up. So just uh, taking the first paragraph that you read. So to the proper function of the thought mind. Now you know we we see that we are thinking all the time, right? We are thinking. The purpose of thought mind is. Sri Aurobindo says, to observe. That is why the tool is there. It is to observe, understand, judge with a dispassionate delight in knowledge and open itself to messages and illuminations playing upon all that it observes and upon all that is yet hidden from it but must be progressively revealed. 
you know so seeing beyond the appearances and that's why this tool of thought mind is there but most of the times we are abusing the thought mind all of us know that we are ruminating regurgitating upon things where there is no need of thought mind to indulge no need at all like i am crossing a road you know so the thought mind is required sense mind is required okay a truck is coming okay this is the way i take you know i have to go left i have to go right in these many seconds i have to cross so all that observation the judgment the understanding is because of thought mind you know and it's it's a one has to be really grateful because we don't realize how grateful we can be that our thought mind is operational because again one misfiring in the brain one you know some something wrong in the brain thought mind not able to function well not not function properly so we can't take it for granted that it's there you know it can go away any moment but you know, most of the time we are just abusing the thought mind and he's sharing how we abuse it so first the function of thought mind is to observe judge understand whatever is the front appearance and then also what is behind the appearance you know, that also is illumined to the thought mind if it's silent yeah progressively be revealed messages and illuminations that secretly flash down to us from the divine oracle concealed in light above our mentality whether they seem to descend through the intuitive mind or arise from the seeing heart you know so it doesn't matter whether they seem to come from here or above but you do get flashes of higher knowledge knowledge which is not a product of logical analysis not a product of analytical reasoning and that's why shurobindo says that the mind has to become like a receptacle to receive the higher planes of mind higher mind illumined mind intuitive mind and i think albert einstein also said that the same mind that has created the problem cannot solve the problem so the resolution of the problem comes from some higher plane it's not the exact logical analytical mind that has the problem that will solve the problem we get the resolutions from somewhere else we don't know what that somewhere else is hmm? but this it cannot do rightly why can't we resolve you know why can't we get these illuminations insights intuitive resolutions but this it cannot do rightly because it is pinned to the limitations of life energy in the senses to the discords of sensation and emotion and to its own limitations of intellectual preference inertia straining self will which are the form taken in it by the interference of this desire mind so it's like one drop of desire mind and the whole game is spoiled you can't have the same purity as you can have without the interference of desire mind and that's why in prayers and meditations we see mother saying you know this interested love a love which does not have any personal interest it doesn't want name it doesn't want fame it doesn't want validation it doesn't want approval it's very happy without whatever action it has taken also inwardly there is contentment there is uh, fulfillment so there is no personal motivation hidden agendas when we go out interact with a person you know or interact in a situation or offer ourselves in a situation there is no personal agenda yeah so this is how we i think he is sharing that how we a uh, spoil or malign the instrumentation of thought mind we impurify it as is said in the upanishads our whole mind consciousness is shot through with the threads and currents of this prana so you know it's like a creating a very visual imagery like you have you know those laser lights you have seen that go very far so it's like there is vast space and which 
laser lights are like just thrown in every direction so that's the desire mind threads of desire minds which is just maligning the tool of thought mind currents of this prana this life energy that strives and limits grasps and misses desires and suffers and only by its purification can we know and possess our real and eternal self so this is where the vigilance part from mother shirobindo it comes into the picture again you know mother says become conscious be vigilant be sincere the moment you see a drop of desire mind you know making something impurified you remove it you don't follow the dictate step back open your eyes to your inner being and this saint kabir has also said you know apne pehre jaagiye na padhe rahiye soye na janu pal ek mein kiska pehra hoye so he says be your own guard wake up be alert because if you are not alert in one moment of your non vigilance the desire mind can creep, creep in and spoil the matters it will take over yeah so any uh, reflections anyone before we we'll take the second paragraph again also <clears throat> hi monica yeah. so there was this um, i think there was this uh, article today or yesterday from uh, the stupid and the wise man did you get to read it no i haven't go ahead you want to share yeah so i think um, what uh, shorobindo says just one minute i'll just pick it out So, I mean, not. I think, like when you said the the previous paragraph, right? Like how we we stick to things and we are constantly we don't want to let go. So he says over here in uh, it's from the mother and. So have you ever seen a wise man and a stupid man in conversation? you will see the wise man putting forth his views with great humility and with much uncertainty in contrast you can see the stupid man asserting his views with an almighty cocksureness and confidence as if he is god himself when you look at them talking it may appear that the stupid man is a superior person with greater knowledge and the wise man as someone ignorant and uncertain unable to hold against the confident assertions of the stupid man so uh, then there's a, another passage by mother who says for people who exercise their intelligence the more intelligent they are the more do they grow aware that they know nothing at all and that with the mind can one can know nothing one may think in a particular way judge and see in a particular way but one is never sure of anything and never will be sure and never will be sure of anything one can always say perhaps it is like that or perhaps it is like this and so on indefinitely because the mind is not an instrument of knowledge thank you yeah. Yeah, i think it's a, really it's nice. a bit, yeah yeah there, i mean there's quite a bit i think by uh, angaraka govinda a tibetan yeah. buddhist teacher uh, so he says that when you go through the mahayana literature you will find this constantly repeated saying a wise humility is the sign of the matured man and a stupid pride is the characteristics of the immature man that's very powerful thank you 
Thank you for bringing it up. Thank you. Yeah. I like also the line that you shared in between that uh, uh, to an external eye, the wise man uh, would appear that, you know, he's not really, he doesn't know much <laughs> because he's unsure yeah. about, uh, you know, whatever he's sa sharing. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's also very interesting. Because this, uh, this, the way, I mean, you know, sometimes, like we all, I mean, yeah, I have had it in times in my life where, you know, some things are just so, you think that they're so certain, right? I mean, without any, uh, without any doubt in your mind that you think that, oh, uh, this certainty is going to sort of last or this permanency is going to be there and um, you, you don't think at that point, you know, this could be, you know, beyond uh, whatever. So, yeah. And, and as, as of course, as the, you know, as, as one, understands or one reflects or, or is able to reflect then um, I think that 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 certainty also sort of you know not not that you know then you become aware and you realize that yeah not everything like it's like seasons right we all uh, we do fall and we do you know I mean the leaves do turn brown and then green and as and that's how we are also like it's a constant uh, you know seasoning for us so yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, anyone else? Anything to add on or share anything? Yes, Swapna? Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, if we, this whole thing about like the desire voice, say, again, say, on, on the other hand, faith, right? If I look in myself and in just like how we, the last person was saying about, the stupid man and the wise man. It's like noticing that the desire voice can often seem so, you know, like, oh, well, you know, why is it so sticky? Because it seems so insistent, right? It seems full of pride, seems so kind of like, no, no, no. Without this thing, you're really going to suffer, you know? And actually the faith uh, is quite, it seems more uncertain, you know, it seems, well, where's the promise that it's going to be okay if I let go or if I, if I don't clasp so tight to the known or whatever it is, you know, that I'm, I'm clinging on to what I'm, whatever I'm being sticky to. It's, it's just interesting. I never thought of it like that, but it's, there seems less proof of the faith, even though intellectually I say I have faith, you know, it seems like an absolute certainty. Well, of course I have faith in the mother to look after me or that the divine is there or all of Sherb and those words are absolutely true. And yet they have somehow this uh, more shaky or less certain quality about it. Yet in, you know, if we, if I liken it to the last parable, that uncertainty is actually the wiser voice. Right, I'd never seen it that way to help me, uh, perhaps align with that voice of faith. Um, that is actually the wi wiser voice, and it's less quiet. Yeah. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Anyone Even else? today, what you shared, right? Uh, I think this morning or yesterday morning. Uh, Monica, what uh, Sri Aurobindo has told N Nirod Niroda, right? Uh, Niroda, yeah. But within there is a soul, and above there is, uh, um, yeah, above there is grace. This is all you know or need to know. So. But I would say to Sri Aurobindo, no, no, that is okay. <laughs> but, yeah. But what about this? <laughs> yes, that's why. <laughs> yeah, oh. I know within there is a soul and above there may be and grace. There is, huh. That's okay, you know. <laughs> you can leave that yeah. aside. But what about this that I am, you know, sticking exactly, to? Exactly, <laughs> no. It's so like uh, your day-to-day, -day, uh, whatever, I mean, your thoughts and, you know, your day-to-day um is like a timetable right i mean it sort of just um takes over your it's like uh, like how this morning when you said i mean you also send that ajancha right 
I mean, you come back to the, no matter what, you come back to it, you come back to the body. But how, how, you know, like when you're actually standing, do you know you're standing? Do you, when you're sleeping, do you know you're lying down? And um, yeah, it, it is, it can be quite a bit of a, not a challenge, but that, bringing yourself back again and again to the, you know, the present moment. And yes, and then knowing that, yes, God is there. And I mean, there is, you know, the larger being and grace is there and the soul is there. But yeah, and to remind yourself uh, every, I think every second of uh, the day that you, you know, sort of live, sometimes it's, yeah, everything just goes out the window and then, you know, you're just, right. Yeah, yeah. I think this is also, I believe, is it's my arrogance which would say, yeah, I know what you are saying. Mm. And, you know, Have you seen that? You know, so if somebody is presenting this quote in front of me, that within there is a soul and above there is grace. Mm. Something in me says, oh, yeah, I know this, you know, what are you mm. talking of? Mm -hmm. I know this is mm. there, but what about this? Mm. So I think that's also my arrogance which stops me from really you know, understanding in the depth of things and mm. also the stickiness, you know, what we were reading, the desire mind, yeah. which is just refusing that. No, yeah, there may be soul, whatever grace, but I am not letting go. You know, forget about mm. it. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Divine comedy. I know divine comedy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we were here. Anyone, any further comments on this first paragraph? So we just saw that how uh, the thought mind gets kind of maligned and uh, it gets of gets impurities of several kinds through this interference and poking of desire mind. And also we have to know that even if it's one drop of poison, it is poison. So I can't say that, uh, no, I have grown. See, my desire is only 1%. <laughs> you know? So that would, because if I give you a glass of water, which is earlier a potable water, you know, you can drink it, drinkable water. And I say, yeah, earlier I had put 10 drops of drain water in it. But now there is only one drop of drain water. Doesn't matter, drink it. You know, Drain water is drain water. So it's like that, that impurity is impurity. It doesn't matter larger impurity or lesser impurity. And that's what each one of us has to be vigilant of. You know, that yes, I see within me and I could sense that unease the moment I sense that impurity. And through that unease, we keep stepping back from that impurity of desire mind. So... Any desire, whether 3%, 4%, 1%, 0.1% is a desire. You cannot say that it's not a desire. Poison is still poison. Many a times we keep uh, consoling ourselves. That, See, I, my desires have really reduced. <laughs> yeah, it's good to fool ourselves. We yeah. are. Desires and suffers, grasps and misses. Okay, yeah, I think... And this one we have taken. So keep sharing if there is uh, anything else. Anyone? And we'll just uh, take up this second passage that Yuan had read. It is true that the root of all this evil is the ego sense. And the seat of the conscious ego sense is the mind itself. But in reality... The conscious mind only reflects an ego already created in the subconscious mind in things. The dumb soul in the stone and plant which is present in all body and life and only finally delivered into voicefulness and wakefulness but not originally created by the conscious mind. So I'm not sure uh, this second half is very clear. So if anyone has clarity on this, you can share. What I understand is that it's like a subconscious imagery that is already forming. I'm not making an effort 
to form an ego sense. The ego sense is already developing. It's like a default mechanism. No, I'm not putting effort in making an ego sense. So that's why he shares that in reality, the conscious mind only reflects an ego sense already created in subconscious mind in things. And then he further, yeah. Because as we see in a so in a plant in a stone, you know, you can't say that it has an ego. But according to this, what I see, it's like it has already started forming, but it can't voice itself out. It can't, yeah, Priyanka, you want to share? Yeah. So, uh, what I uh, understood from this was that as we have evolved and become humans, but when this we have evolved from stone though we are humans now but we are still carrying the the consciousness of stone still within us which is so dumb inert and still present those those instincts so present in us that we have to evolve out of that too that's what i understood the dumb soul in the stone because uh in life divine in the chapter when uh, i don't remember now uh, when shirobindo writes that uh, you know uh, in the atom uh, when this you know you, the universe was manifested the atom has the desire inherent in it and first there was this stone and then life reflected from stone and then further, further, the evolution that happened, you know. I'm not so clear about it right now, but I read it a long time back. So uh, this, from this, I understand this only, that the dumb soul in the stone and the plant, which is present in all body and life, and only finally delivered into voicefulness and wakefulness, which means the humans, who have the the you know who are who have a voice who have an uh, 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 an awakened consciousness we have it in us it's just that it is still sleeping we are still not aware of our though we have that buddhi the discriminative power you know which is different from animal or let's say a plant or certainly a you know a stone but that conscious because it says that even though the seat of the evil is the conscious mind, is the mind, but that which is present, that we that we function with ego today in, in our current life is actually coming from the subconscious, which is deep inside, which we are carrying as we have evolved from a stone because, you know, it took many years, millennia for, uh, for a stone to evolve, let's say, maybe not a stone evolved, but whatever evolved, maybe a stone evolved into a blade of grass. So earlier there was nothing when there was this, this full void darkness or whatever, pregnant with all potentialities. And when the manifestation happened, then everything just didn't happen in one go. But there was a progressive evolution from a stone to, this, to the plant, to the simplest life forms, animals, unicellular, to more evolved forms, to multicellular, and then to even in multicellular from animals to humans with a discriminative intellect. Though we have evolved, though the, uh, uh, the matter has evolved from a stone to this human, but yet the consciousness in us, the, sub, the, the ego that is present in us, we are still carrying that of the of the stone you know yeah that makes sense yeah, yeah. thank you so much yes. yeah. <laughs> can i also read something yeah. that i yeah please I why not yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, i just well, while i was reading this some thoughts came into my mind and please forgive me because my writing is very uh, immature raw but uh, just wanted to share it here so when I just read this, I it just this thought came into my mind and I just wrote a few lines. And uh, so I wrote, we are living in matter more than anything else, rigid, inert, non-plastic, desirous to change, 
but unable to do so owing to our own gathered implasticity, gathered over eons in our journey of evolution from stone to man. Man we have become in our appearance, but we are still carrying within the unconscious of stone, forever imprisoned in our primitive nature. Man has to evolve out of stone to be man and then to be superman, that is the divine human. Yeah, that was really nice. Thank you for sharing. Yes, beautiful. Thank you for allowing. Yeah, me. you wrote that, Priyanka. Yeah, it okay. just it's. I was, I was reading it because you've taken up this study last week, uh -huh. and it really, you know, it it's it was something that I've been wanting to read this synthesis of yoga, but it's not happening, Monica. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for you know taking up these chapters because it then prompts me to read. And while I was reading last week some of these pages. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Some, something just flew through. You know, just, I don't know. I just wrote in. in That's that. really nice. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I think yeah. <laughs> it was your those yeah. 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 Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody? Anything here? Until here. Okay, so we can maybe take this on. And the last one, I already a little bit touched upon it, but if we can take more reflections if there are any. And in this upward procession, it is the life energy which has become the obstinate knot of the ego. It is the desire mind which refuses to relax the knot. Even when the intellect and heart have discovered the cause of their ills and would be glad enough to remove it. So this is what we were touching upon uh, for practical purposes. Of course, we can go into uh, philosophical discussion as well, but not maybe taking that direction here This for this one. And uh, you know that the practical purpose is that, just a second. Just a second. Yeah. Yeah, so I think for, for practical purposes, what I understood, and of course we can take up more reflections, is that intellectually I may be understanding that this is not good for me sticking and you know attaching to things and becoming too rigid and non-plastic as uh, Priyanka was sharing but then I ask myself how do I do it you know and that's because I am stubborn because what I want is what I really really want and I'm not going to be happy if I don't get that and that's the desire mind which refuses to relax the knot even when the intellect and heart have discovered the cause of their ills and would be glad enough to remove it for the prana in them is the animal who revolts and who obscures and deceives their knowledge and coerces their will by his refusal in animals we can see their you know their territories for example you know so that as priyanka was sharing we are carrying that consciousness within us and how dare you come into my territory and there can be fights and people can kill each other. even you know in chimps when we were reading works of jane goodall we were uh, re hearing that they also have like categories and groups and uh, there was a war going on between certain groups and they were killing each other that how dare you come into my territory so we also you know, uh, carry that same consciousness which refuses which revolts and obscures and deceives the knowledge of heart and intellect and overrides it and coerces their will by his refusal. And the animal is saying, no, 
you may die the body may give up you may have 10000 diseases but i am not going to let go of my stubbornness that's the stubbornness of the desire man yeah anything here I just want to go back to a point we made a few minutes ago about like, you know, we have so much intellect and knowledge um, about like what would truly satisfy or fulfill, you know, and the stickiness or design mind goes to these things that often we, we know that they either not good for us or they could at least be laid at mother and share in those feet um, more openly or just less sticky about it. And then this knowledge gap, right? This knowledge of, look, there is this deeper longing or, or everything they say when it resonates, you know, and you're like, yes, yes, I know that. And then there's this, somehow this belief, this false belief, right? That the how has to come from someone else or from somewhere out there or I have yet to learn it. You know, I don't know how. And so I was just kind of contemplating with that. It's like, well, there's been an accumulation of knowledge in myself, perhaps for many of us, you know, over a number of years, maybe even decades. And so now to kind of contemplate, well, what if I did know the how, right? Like I don't have to wait for something in the future to come to give me the how or something on the outside to give me the how. And so just that contemplation of, well, what would it be if I, or this I, whatever this is, or from somewhere within, the knowledge to apply it or if not the knowledge then simply some kind of energy or vibration that allows the application of the knowledge you know into to flow into life yeah um not that i have any answers yet but i just yeah. noticed that you know not yeah. to, to stop waiting for something else beautiful yes now there's something coming to me here maybe i'd like to share that you know in just the example that i earlier shared that if somebody is telling me that what I am holding on to is poison and I must let go of it, I will not be able to let go of it unless I see it myself with my vision that it's poison. Now then I would not need to ask the other person, oh, I know you are right, you know, it may be not right for me, but how do I leave it, right? Because if I truly see it as poison, then it's like fingers open and drop. Why my fingers are not opening is because I don't see it as a poison. So I have to stop, I think, first of all, fooling myself, even intellectually, that I know. I really don't know. I don't see because if I will be really, really seeing, then I won't, for example, you know, very simple example, trivial example, like you're walking and there is like in India, we have cows, uh, you know, uh, potty everywhere we go because there are cows on the streets, the cows everywhere, the land also belongs to them. So we are taking care, okay, not to step here, not to step here, right? So when I'm walking, do I need to ask someone, oh, I know it's cow's potty here, but uh, how do I evade it? How do I not step over it? It's like stupidity. If I see it's cow, cow's potty, then I would very, you know, well know how to evade it, how to step aside it, right? So the very fact that I am not able to step aside tells me that I am not able to see that it's cow's potty in front of me. But that I would not agree to because that's my arrogance. I would say, no, 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 no. I understand what is grace. I understand that there is soul within. But you forget about that. You tell me how to fulfill my, my desire through this particular thing that I'm hell bent upon. So I think for me, it seems that it's my arrogance, intellectual arrogance, which is telling me that I know. And yet, I don't know how to let go. Because if I really, really knew that it's poison in my hands, it's like opening of hand and dropping the poison. 
the very fact that i am clutching it tightly means that i don't really really truly see that it's poison so what i am indicating towards is that how attachment is poison in our life how stickiness is poison in our life stickiness to ideas stickiness to images stickiness to people life situations my ideas of life we don't yet see it as poison desire we don't yet see it as poison if if that revelation comes to me that yes it is oh i clearly can see it ruins my life i would not be needing to ask somebody else okay how to do it you know i think that's for me i see that the moment i see behind the appearance of desire that no this is really poison for me for the other person it's poison that's why i would not like to hold it immediately my hand opens and the poison falls before that i can't see that it's poisonous before that i may think that i know it is bad for me that's why i have to keep asking everyone oh how do i leave it how do i leave it if i truly truly knew you know that for example people who eat meat i am not against you know people eating meat if you if the body permits people must eat meat but many a times if we want to leave we are not able to leave what really helps is that you go to a butcher shop you know and you see it happening in front of your eyes and then if you can eat it okay eat it you know so that because then you see what you are eating otherwise you know we we can't we, we may think that oh i have been thinking of giving up this thing but i have not been able to would you let me know how to do you know otherwise it's like that but if i see it in front of me that oh my god oh my god what am i doing then the next time i won't maybe you know i won't be if i really want to give up so to see really really truly see what desire is what attachment is how poisonous stickiness is that really helps and if i still have to ask yes i know all that but how to let go of attachment then it means i don't know the poisonous character of attachment you know that i have to admit to myself not to anybody else but to myself so i can't just keep saying that i know what is attachment no i don't know what is attachment no? so just yeah reflecting on my own experiences that what that was what came to me and kabir uh, saint kabir has said such kind of people like us uh, sayar gyani you know that it's like a wandering knowledgeable fellow non wandering wise fellow so you think you know but still see you are knocking on every door and asking but how do i let go how do i let go but on the other hand you say that you know so he uses the word wandering wise fellow you, know, you still don't have a clue that's what happens with us we may read a lot we may understand a lot intellectually but when it comes to giving up desires then we are struggling and then we are asking how to do it so it means that i don't know the true nature of desire okay so this is a big one can maybe take it yeah today also yeah what do you say the next paragraph shall we take it today or maybe leave it here anyone any thoughts yeah monica i'll have yeah. to leave now okay. my daughter has an exam tomorrow so okay yeah. all right thank okay. you thank you okay. for thank you bye bye so maybe we can take this first part and then leave it in the middle then take the second part next time yeah this one 
Yeah, so he shared that desire mind uh, interferes, pokes itself in everything and that's why meddles the affairs. And then this one, so would anyone want to read it out aloud? Therefore, the mental Purusha has to, sorry, mental Purusha has to separate himself from association and self-identification with this desire mind. He has to say, I am not this thing that struggles and suffers, grieves and rejoices, loves and hates, hopes and is baffled, is angry and afraid and cheerful and depressed, a thing of vital moods and emotional passions. All these are merely workings and habits of prakriti in the sensational and emotional mind. The mind then draws back from its emotions and becomes with these, as with the bodily movements and experiences, the observer or witness. There is again an inner cleavage. There is this emotional mind in which these moods and passions continue to occur according to the habit of the nodes of nature. And there is the observing mind which sees them, studies and understands, but is detached from them. It observes them as if in a sort of action and play on a mental stage of personages other than itself. At first with interest and a habit of relapse into identification, then with entire calm and detachment. And finally, attaining not only to calm, but to the pure delight of its own silent existence, with a smile at their unreality, as at the imaginary joys and sorrows of a child who is playing and loses himself in the play. Yeah, thank you so much. Beautiful uh, paragraph again. As if he's like holding our hand and you know walking us through uh, how to disentangle, knowing that we are entangled, and now what is the process of disentangling? And in this, I think paragraph we can see that there are many many teachers, masters. For example, I was thinking of Rupert Spira, how he again and again stresses upon taking stance as the awareness uh, for which all becomes a play. And that's what, uh, you know, if, the, we see in Buddhism, you know, we talk about these teachings where we become mindful. We are just looking at our thoughts coming and go, emotions come and go. And it's like a play in front of that witnessing awareness. And that is how you step away and disentangle like there is a gap now from the you know, happenings and the awareness like there is a big gap so this is what he refers to as inner cleavage therefore the mental purusha has to separate himself from association so association and identification with thoughts too much storylines feelings that i am the thought i am the storyline this is me the role the image one has to dissociate oneself from that, separate himself from association and self-identification with his desire mind. So for all of us, you know, who struggle with our desires, now I can step back from the desire mind and I can say, yeah, I can see the desire mind from a distance. So far it was ruling me, but now I can see that it is there in front of me. And there are times where I can step back and say, no. I would not like to follow it. So there is a distance, you know, you are stepping back as a witness. I'm not identified now with the desire mind. He has to say, I am not this thing. Now again, the uh, neti neti comes in picture, you know, in Vedantic tradition, we have a neti, like not this. I'm not the thought, I'm not the feeling, I'm not 
the image and not the role so you're doing negation of uh, you know, all the things that you can see to reach or to realize actually not to reach to realize who you truly are so i am not this thing that struggles and suffers grieves and rejoices loves and hates hopes and is baffled is angry and afraid and cheerful and depressed so all these colors i am not all these colors i can see them happening a thing of vital moods and emotional passions all these are merely workings and habits of prakriti in the sensational and emotional mind so you see like as if a display is going on in the sky clouds are coming dark clouds light clouds flurry clouds and they are all coming going coming going so one becomes more like a witness of all these happenings in the being the mind then draws back from its emotions and becomes with these as with the bodily movements and experience so even there is a detachment from the bodily movement because you can see oh the leg is moving so i can see the leg moving i am not the leg moving you know i can see it moving so again there is a again headache pain some you know discomfort that one may have in the body there is a possibility to detach oneself from that happening in the body there have been uh, stories of many masters true yogis who have had operations surgeries done on them their body without any anesthesia so shows how much one can really truly detach one's consciousness from the body so draws back from its emotions and becomes with these as with the bodily movements and experiences the observer or the witness so we can't we have to know why we are reading this we can't bypass this step no one here can bypass being a witness and directly you know enter some realized state we have to disentangle ourselves from and continue that disentanglement because by default we live in dis uh, we live in entanglement so my effort is to disentangle so become witness at least for 5 minutes 3 minutes whenever we have time in between and then it stretches throughout the day the mind then draws back yeah there is again an inner cleavage there is this emotional mind in so what is the cleavage he is telling there is this emotional mind in which these moods passions continue to occur according to the habit or the modes of nature so now you can see them as ripples in your being you know somebody said something and earlier it used to arise a lot of anger in you you know this time when somebody says something now you see the ripple of anger but you yourself don't become angry you know you see the ripple there and you step back from it so the witness is active now so you see this habit of modes of nature and there is the observing mind which sees them studies and understands but is detached from them i think all of us may have uh, you know by this time glimpses of these things in within us it observes them as if in a sort of action and play on mental stage of personage personages other than itself so i see that oh this is my role that is tied up with this character in my life that's why it is playing itself out but i am not that role i am beyond that role so that expansion one can feel at first with interest and a habit of relapse into identification so it's like a pendulum like movement you know that at times i am very stable as a witness at times i am totally lost again identified in that role and becoming victim again feeling the blame feeling the game you know feeling angry frustrated annoyed because i'm totally again identified in the character and then again i am able to step back take stance as a witness so there is a habit of relapse into identification then with entire calm and detachment so he's talking about the stages at first we do it with interest and a habit of relapse into identification then with entire calm and detachment becomes more stable and then finally attaining not only to calm but to the pure delight of its own silent existence so this witnessing purusha in us the mental purusha or witnessing purusha 
the more we take stance as the witness in purusha there is a delight in that so there he says that now i am not even waiting for some calm to come through that stance there is a delight for the pure delight so you are your own best friend in that sense to the pure delight of its own silent existence with a smile at their unreality so all the roles images dramas frustrations of life they now become a, a unreal thing like illusory phenomenon coming and going and coming and going and that's why i don't have to take that so seriously you know so one can smile at it because they are feeble they are fleeting with a smile at their unreality as the imaginary joys and sorrows of a child who is playing and loses himself in the play you know this we have seen with little children how in a moment of a play they become very obsessive and then they let go the next moment then again becoming very you know stubborn for something which is just a toy now for a parent it's just a toy but for a child it would have mattered a lot so the child has lost itself in the story the toy the game yeah but now the more we take stance as this witnessing purusha there is more chances of you know a calm stability and pure delight so maybe next half we can take next time yeah so anything here anyone Yeah, it's very enlightening actually. In the Bhagavad Gita, how they say that the self is the best friend of the transformed self, and and it's the worst enemy of the regenerate self. So it puts that forward in no uncertain and unequivocal terms. I would say. So it's really enlightening. Thanks. Yeah, it is enlightening, no doubt. Okay. Any last comments before we end? Any? I think it helped me see how many times when I have this, you know, we've said in the sessions you've said often, Monica, about being my very best friend, and how somehow reading this passage it it opened up again that often I'm thinking of being my very best friend from this rather small place, you know, it's like somehow a vital me, ego me, trying to be my very best friend, and then no wonder it doesn't seem enough, you know, or it reaches and grasps for things. But yet this just touches in that amazing expansion that can happen through being in touch with truth or in satsang, you know, so like reading Sherbindo's words or in in whatever ways that one is really just feeling so wide and and the normal edges are gone or borders and then that being the very best friend right like so it kind of like ups the ante or raises the bar on what it is really beautiful yes yeah it's yeah. beautiful thank you that's a very good observation yeah thank you for sharing yes great okay so I think we can maybe take a pause here for today and next time we can take up the next half. So thank you everyone. And before we end, for those of us who are left, maybe we can send a silent sharing of merit, uh, taking a moment and sharing this merit, joy and delight of reading these words, the expansion that we feel within ourselves May all of us partake of this expansion, joy, and delight. May we have peace in our hearts and joy and progress in lives. Okay, thank you everyone, thank you for joining, bye bye.